after I pray. Not 29, 28. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity that we could come here tonight. We thank you for your goodness and your kindness. We ask that you would uh, just speak through the music, Lord, and uh, just speak through the message to touch our hearts and transform us from the inside out. We ask for your blessing on tonight and just ask uh, that you would just come and meet us here. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's all stand and let's worship. Oh, it's too late now. No, you can still do it. Uh, well, then what do I say? We're going to sing a song. Is this on? It is. is on? It is? Hello? We're going to sing a song led by Morgan over here. She's really cool. It's called Enter the Gates. You might have heard it sometime at some point. Probably in church if you heard it, most likely. We're on the Christian radio. Okay.
kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free for who can stop the lord almighty our god is the lion the lion of judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles every knee will bow before him our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Oh, every knee will bow before Him Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Father, Lord, we just thank you uh, for this time where we uh, get to worship you and learn more about you. God, we just uh, pray over this time that uh, our minds and our hearts would just be opened to what you have for us today. Uh, we love you so much, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Make sure if you do not have a Bible, you go ahead and grab one. We're going to be jumping into 1 John tonight, which is towards the very end of the Bible. Um, and so you can look up what page number it is. If you have one of these Bibles, we're going to be on a page 1387. Um, if somebody has one of the borrow Bibles and want to shout out what page it is, I'm going to do my best not to kick this, but uh, I run around a lot. And so don't be distracted if I just 
kick something. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about love being made known and uh, talking a whole lot about love tonight. Love is a word that we throw around quite frequently. Um, I think in this last week, I think I've said I've loved all of these different things and probably so much more. I said that I love pizza. I've loved my friends. I have loved my significant other, which is my wife. I have loved the movies. We're watching the Marvel series all the way through again and uh, just really enjoy watching movies. Um, I love free food. I was at a wedding this past weekend. You mentioned free food, and I'm going to be there. Um, free food is one of my favorite things. Kathy Roars is notorious for the free food to get people to come and hang out with her, which is, I mean, it's brilliant. Free food. Yeah, it's bribery at its finest. Anytime, any place, if you say there's going to be free food, I'm showing up. Uh, I've told my parents that I love them. Um, I've dropped my phone like two weeks ago, and I dropped it on a mountain that was like 13,000 feet high, and uh, I picked it up afterwards, and I loved that my phone was not actually cracked, even though the fake glass got a little chip. I mean, it went pretty far down that mountain, I'm not going to lie. Like, it like started sliding, and I was like, dude, that phone is toast. Uh, it's an iPhone 10. I didn't think it was going to survive the fall. So that was the one time this week I've said, I've, or two weeks ago, that I've loved my phone. Uh, the other day, I was taking a shower, and I don't do this very often because I'm a terrible singer, but there was a song in my head, and I started singing in the shower, which was scary for my dog. I think he started howling and Bad things were happening because he thought I was dying. Uh, speaking of loving things, I love my dog a lot. Uh, my dog has this new habit with me that uh, a lot of times he will just like come and just literally not remove himself from my side, especially when I was gone for a week. Like that dog was just like stuck on my hip. Um, I love my favorite sport, which I'll let you guys guess what that is. If you don't know me, it won't take long. Uh, there's one over there. Um, I love me time. Anybody had any good me time recently? Like you've put away the phone and you've just like chilled with yourself. Super awkward, but I love when I have opportunities for that. Uh, and so we use this word love a lot. Like how many times did I just say the word love in like the last two and a half minutes? More than I can count, like 20 times. And so a lot of times we say that we love these inanimate objects or love others or sometimes animate objects and we just throw this word around casually. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think we sometimes confuse the word love with the word sometimes like or admire or something that we just enjoy because of this kind of confusion in our language. Uh, here's some other things that you might say and not really mean. This one I'm kind of notorious for. If somebody says, how, you're do how are you doing? I'll answer with, I'm fine. And whenever somebody answers, guys, listen up. If a girl ever answers with, I'm fine, she's not fine. Um, she may be fine, but she's not fine. So you have to be careful when you answer questions because sometimes you don't receive what you think you are and you might kind of go on with the situation like, oh, you're fine, great, everything's good. Typically, she's not fine. That's just from a little bit of experience being married 12 years. Um, another one of them, and I'm guilty of saying this, I'm almost there. And you know when somebody says they're almost there, their butt is still on the couch looking on Instagram, and they've not gotten up, got into the vehicle, and started making the trek. Life360 app helps some of you guys out to determine where your friends are located and if they're actually telling the truth. Correct? Anybody have Life360? I know some of you do. And you know your friends are checking in on you. Another one that I often hear, kind of like that I love you, but it really isn't I love you. Your baby is so cute. I don't have kids, so I can say this one. Uh, most babies look the same when they're a baby, in my opinion. Um, maybe if you've birthed a baby, you really think your kid is the cutest. That's fine. I've never, and I never will birth a baby. So, um, yeah, you have that. So a lot of times we say things, but the meaning behind it is lost. Like, I love blank. And it doesn't actually really mean anything. I love whatever, and yet the, there's no substance to it. I mean, it's more like I like something, or I might admire something, or that's just something convenient to have. So God's word points out to us so much about love. 
And I think it really does help us understand how we are to love others. And that's really what we're going to be talking about tonight. And yet, it isn't just something that's thrown out there lightly. It's not that it's something God didn't really mean. In fact, it kind of builds on last week. So if you were not here last week, I encourage you to go to our YouTube, check out Tori's message. It was awesome. It was all about being a child of God. And that's that foundation of understanding God's love for us. And from understanding God's love for us gives us the ability to love other people. Without the understanding of God's deep, passionate, caring love for us, which is different than what the rest of the world shows us very often, God's love is so much greater, so much different, that if we don't have that foundation, it's hard to truly love other people. So 1 John chapter 3, that's where we're at tonight. Go ahead and get in your Bibles. 1 John chapter 3. The chapters are the big numbers. The little numbers are that verses. It is also up on the screen if you can't end up finding it or just like to look up there instead. So I'm gonna read a couple of chunks. I'm gonna describe between each chunk a little bit about it. So I'm not gonna read everything at once. We're gonna be reading a bunch of verses tonight, 10 through 24, but I'll just take it chunk by chunk. So here we go. First John chapter three, verse 10. This is right where we left off last week. We're just continuing on. So now we can tell who are children of God and who are the children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. And this is the message you have heard from the beginning. You should love one another. We must not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And, did, and why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil and his brother had been doing what was righteousness. So don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. So this message John is writing, this is a letter to a group of followers in the first century, and he's describing what it looks like to begin to love one another. And he brings back a story from the very beginning of the Bible. The first children in the story of God commit murder against one another. The story of Cain and Abel. And that's not how we love one another. Like, if you sit there and murder somebody, that's not a good example of love. Would everybody agree? If you don't agree, we'll have a conversation after this, and we'll have another conversation probably after that. Because murder is almost universally accepted as evil and bad, the opposite of love. But he goes into this story to show us the opposite, to show us what love should look like. So we're jumping back in, verse 14. If we love our Christian brother and sisters, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers do not have eternal life within them. And it keeps going and it says this. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Ouch. That was kind of pointed. And so we begin to see this word love used again and again. And I think it's important that we begin to break down what this word is. The word love is agape. Say agape with me. Hit the next slide, Cindy. Agape. Agape. So we have a church in town called agape, and that actually means the word love. In 1 John 4, 8, so we're going to get to this in a few weeks from now, it has a three-word sentence. God is agape. God is love. In the Greek language, there's multiple versions of the word love. And I'm going to briefly talk on each one of those. The first one is eros. And eros is the word for a devoted relationship. Uh, It has sexuality involved in it. It is that you are on a deep personal level with another person, and you are in a deep committed relationship with them. It is a romantic love. So that's eros. Then there's philile, which sounds like Philadelphia. 
Philippi, kind of. Philadelphia is the city of, anybody know? Brotherly love, who was that? Sherry, great job. So Philile is brotherly love. It is just like a kind of mutual relationship. Uh, Who hates their sibling at at times, but also loves their sibling deeply? Or siblings. You may hear about that next Sunday a little bit if you come to you Sunday. Um, Because a lot of times, those people that we're closest with, we have to figure out how to love them, but they also get on our nerves. And so it's this constant relationship of companionship. But that's not where God's talking. God is talking about kind of this new form of love, which is agape. So it's this third form of love that, again, we only have one word for love, don't we? When somebody says the word love, it means lots of different things to a lot of different people. Correct? And so when we're talking about love, especially in this passage, and I look through and everything in this passage is the word agape or a form of the word agape. They have a lot of prefixes, but mostly suffixes on words in Greek. And so all of these in this chapter are not eros and philippe. They are agape. So this is a godly kind of love. This is a different type of love. When we talk about love, it is God's nature. 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. God is agape. So we have to define that a little bit. This is a love for all people. It is a love for the unlovable and the unlovely and the unloving. It is a love that is sacrificial. We just read that, that Jesus would sacrifice himself. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. It also is a form of humility. You cannot have love if you are boastful and proud. It's the exact opposite, humble humility. That is this type of love. It is a moral love. It is a righteous love. It is doing the right thing. It is a love that does not seek out evil or injustice. And we'll read in just a few seconds, this is a love that always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Is it a love that is unmerited, which means you and I do not deserve it? Romans 5.8 says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't because we were so great. It wasn't because we had done all these great things for God. It was because we were sinners and broken. Last week, we talked in 1 John 3, 1, that talks about God has lavished his love on us. That is a very pricey, expensive love to us. So God's love within you always points to action. Agape is not passive. Agape does not take a seat. Agape is out serving, showing love to other people. But it's also a lot more than words. It's more than I love pizza. It's more than blanket statements, I love blank. It's all about the things that you do. And we're going to see that here in a second. Verse 18, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other, but let us show the truth of our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth, so we will be confident when we stand before God, even if we are guilty, God is greater than our feelings, and he knows everything. And then verse 21 tells us this, dear friends, do not feel guilty when we have come to God with bold confidence and because we will receive in him whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things he pleases. Verse 23, and this is his command. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded. And those who obey God's command remain in fellowship with him and he with them. And, he, and they will know, we, know he lives in us because the spirit he gave us lives in us. We are known by our love for God. We are known by our righteous acts. We are known not in the sense of that eros love or that philea love, but the agape love of God that we share and show other people. And that agape love is so much different than the love this world has to offer. I mentioned earlier I was at a wedding this past weekend. And at most weddings, they read this really long scripture passage from 1 Corinthians 13. Has anybody ever heard of 1 Corinthians 13 at a wedding? 
I don't think I've ever been to a wedding, most even non-Christian weddings, which means like it's not held in a church, it's not like a pastor performing it. A lot of times, even those kind of weddings will have this passage because it is so well known as the passage of this is what you need to say when you get married. But the crazy thing is, if you go back to 1 Corinthians 13, this was not written to a husband or to a wife. This was written to the church that this is the way that you should love each other, which is kind of crazy. I'm not saying it's not a good verse at a wedding. I had it in my wedding. Like 12 years ago, on December 5th, 2009, this scripture was read at my wedding. It's not a bad wedding scripture. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But the original context was meant for the church. So let's read it together. Well, I'll read it because we never read things together well in here. Somebody always has a different translation and it goes crazy. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. Sneak peek, I'm not going to talk about this much. You need to come to you Sunday. They're going to be talking about this in detail. So here we go. If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but did not love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed the knowledge, and if I had faith that I could move mountains but did not love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I did not love others, I would gain nothing. And this is the passage that they really talk about in weddings. Verse 4, love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own. It is not irritable. It does not keep records of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth went out, wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, endures even through circumstances. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and I thought and reasoned as a child. But as I grew up, I put away childish things. Now see these things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But we will see everything perfectly clear. All that I know is partial and incomplete, but I know everything, everything will be complete, just as God knows me completely. These three, three things last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. If the church, if you and I were to love people like this, it is very difficult first off. We would change the world from the inside out. Because loving one another in this new form of love, this agape form of love, it's not really new. It's over 2,000 years old. In fact, it's really at the beginning of God's story is this story of love and redemption. But if we were to reclaim the word love, that agape love, we could make a huge, huge difference in our local community, and that would spread throughout the world. And so how do we love one another? You can go ahead and go to the next slide. It's probably... And so uh, the, what, the first thing is, I think, that we have to know God's love. We talked about that a lot last week, that you and I, first and foremost, would know God's love, that God calls us his children, that he lavishly loves you, that Jesus died for you. And so that's that intimate, personal, firsthand knowledge that God cares about me. This is more than head knowledge. When I say knowledge, a lot of times in our 21st century brain, we're thinking about math, two plus two equals four. That's knowledge, but that's not the kind of knowledge the Bible is talking about. It's knowledge that connects the head and the heart together. It's this experience of knowing who God is. The depths of who we are, we actually can think that God truly loves me. The next thing is to love like Jesus these are very basic things, but I think if we actually do them, things will be totally different. I encourage you to read through 1 Corinthians 13, like at least three times between now and next week. Can you do that? Three times, 1 Corinthians. That took me like 30 seconds to read. 
You can literally search, if you don't even have a Bible at home, you can just pull open your phone, type in 1 Corinthians 13, and I guarantee you something will pop up in Google that will allow you to read it. But don't just say it, don't just read it. Begin to allow it to do what the scripture tells us. And also, who in your circle of influence needs to hear that as well? So don't just read it, live it out, and then who do you need to tell about how to love other people well? And the last thing is putting that all into practice. Love the unlovable and the unloving. This is the hardest part. Jesus tells us it is easy to love those who love us. But Jesus calls us in, uh, sorry, in Luke 6, 23 to 30, 32 to 36, Luke 6, 32 to 36, that we are called to not just love those who love us, but love those who are our enemies. That's difficult. To love those who don't want us to succeed in life. To love those who do not like you as a person. To love those who have wronged you, who have done bad things to you. And this takes time, this takes energy, this takes Jesus coming in and really kind of wrecking your heart and allowing him to see you and to see others as a child of God, which is what we talked about last week. Again, if you did not come last week, I encourage you, watch that uh, online. It's there for you. Super great message on what it looks like to know you are a child of God and other people are a child of God. Because it's really easy to think God loves me, but God doesn't love this person. This person's mean to me. God does not love them. So the next 15 seconds, we're going to do something a little different. We don't always do this. I just want you to, to just think for about the next 15 seconds, who in your life would you consider that last thing, unlovable or unloving? So just think in your brain. I don't want you to raise your hand. Do not shout out a name at this time. Even if you want to, hold it in 15 seconds. Now I want you to pray for the next 15 seconds. You're not praying out loud. Just pray in your head for the next 15 seconds. Pray for how you can show that person love. How you can be Jesus to that person. How you can take the knowledge of God being inside of you, God loving you, and sharing it with that person. Take 15 seconds. So how are you going to fulfill that? You've thought about the person or persons. You've prayed over how. I encourage you to take the steps and the actions to show love to one another. This series is called Love Made Known. Love is normally not known if it is not experienced, if it is not verbally said and physically in some way experienced that shows that agape type of love. So... What ways can you go from here and show somebody that agape love? Show somebody that kind of love that is self-sacrificing, that is truly of God. Truly the way that always protects, always trusts, and always hopes, and always perseveres. Let us pray. Jesus, I thank you for today. I thank you for this opportunity where we can reflect a little bit on the love that you first have given to us and you've given it to us without cost. It cost you a lot. It cost your son his life. And yet you offer it for free to us because you deeply, personally love each one of us. And we thank you for that. We thank you that your grace goes before us in whatever conversations we need to have this week to show somebody who we may not see as loving or lovable uh, 
the, the good news of Jesus through our words, through our actions, Lord. But don't just let it be head knowledge, Lord. Move it from our head to our heart and out through our hands, out through our words. Let us be the people you have called us to be as John has encouraged us in this letter to love one another. And that is truly what love made known looks like, that we are those people who allow others to experience your love. In your name we pray, amen.
let's say our breakthrough prayer together. Cindy's probably gonna have to pull that up. Thank you, Jennifer, doing slides. I didn't notice that was you up there. I said Cindy earlier, and then I looked up, and I was like, that wasn't Cindy. So our breakthrough prayer goes like this. You can say it with us. If you haven't memorized, I encourage you to close your eyes. Father, unleash the power of the Holy Spirit to bring spiritual breakthrough in my life, in our church family, and in our community. Fill us with humility, unity, and passion. And may your kingdom come and your will be done. And may the name of Jesus be held in high honor in all that we say and do. Amen. We're going to now go into the time of food. Again, if you're new here, they'll take care of you. Um, Head on in there. Then we'll head to life groups after that. Good job, guys. Good.